these students uh, traveling from the brainstem to the cortex. We have to stop in the cerebellum. Uh, today I'd like to describe the intracerebellar connections and the next time the afferent and efferent pathways of the cerebellum. <coughs> Everybody heard in the practice uh, that the cerebellum is located behind the fourth ventricle. Uh, you see here the fastigium, uh, which uh, has two uh, medullary vela, the superior medullary vela and the inferior medullary vela. And uh, uh, what we see here on the mid sagittal section from the cerebellum is the vermis. Uh, the vermis has a little bit shorter radius compared to the hemispheres. And what we studied already in the gross anatomy practice, that the very first unit uh, is called a lingula. This is located on the superior medullary velum. And the last one is the nodule. And the one before the last is the uvula. I have to highlight here that the unit of the cerebellum is called folium in contrast to the gyrus in the cerebral cortex. But in both, the green matter is the superficial and the white matter is found inside. Uh, so the uh, vermis has shorter radius as you see in the picture and the hemisphere has a bit larger extension, especially posteriorly. Uh, on the next uh, figure, uh, you see uh, different color codes uh, representing the intracerebellar nuclei, which uh, is the major source of the efferent pathways. And uh, you see the corresponding uh, parts of the, uh, uh, the cerebellar cortex from where the Purkinje cells are projected to the different uh, uh, nuclei. Uh, with gr in gross anatomy, with our naked eyes, we were able to see the biggest uh, nucleus called the dentate nucleus, but we have two, uh, uh, two others in the vicinity, emboliform and globus, and another one uh, close to the midline, the fastigial nucleus. So altogether we have four pairs of uh, intracerebellar or just simply cerebellar nuclei, or in some figures we have been mentioned as deep uh, cerebellar nuclei. And you see here that the uh, largest part of the cerebellum, the lateral part, uh, is connected to the dentate nucleus, the medial part of the uh, uh, cerebral hemisphere to the globus and emboliform, and the vermis, and uh, the most ancient part, which is not so well seen here, the uh, nodules and the flocculus projected to the vestigial nucleus. We will see this later in the next uh, lecture. Uh, in MR picture, we are able to see also the vermis, uh, but here it's a bit out of the mitral plane, so that's why we see the largest folium called tonsil. And uh, with high magnification, you see this quite well. And the, the tonsil has a very important uh, clinical uh, significance in case of increased intracranial pressure, because uh, the tonsil is entrapped in the bony frame called foramen magnum and can compress the underlying centers in the medulla oblongata. Uh, respiratory and circulatory centers which may lead to death. You, you see with different uh, color codes the three major parts of the cerebellum from a phylogenetic uh, aspect and functional aspect. The most ancient part of the cerebellum is called flocculonodular lobe which is located on the inferior surface. Uh, the uh, nodule was mentioned earlier in the vicinity of the fastigium and the inferior medullary velum, and now laterally the corresponding part of the nodules on the hemisphere is the flocule, which is uh, similar to a Beggs antenna, and we have two uh, all together. So these three elements together form the flocculonodular lobe uh, or archicerebellum and from a functional aspect it's called the vestibular cerebellum because this is which receives the vestibular input from the inner ear so this way it's logic why the cerebellum plays a very important role in the maintenance of the balance or equilibrium the next part of the cerebellum is the anterior lobe which is located in front of the uh, primary fissure and it's not so laterally extended part uh, this is also called paleocerebellum or from a functional aspect 
spinal cerebellum. This is which is safely input from the muscle uh, spindle and the GTO, so from the proprioceptors. That's why the different spinal cerebellar tract will be projected to here. I will mention them on the next uh, in the lecture. And uh, the last, which is the most extended part of the cerebellum, is the posterior lobe, or called neocerebellum, the most developed in a human. And this is called functionally a spontocerebellum or cerebropontocerebellum. Unfortunately, the ponto uh, term is missing from this uh, uh, description. Uh, I have to highlight otherwise that between the cerebral cortex and the cerebellar cortex, we don't have direct connection. Uh, this, the cerebral cortex is connected to the cerebellum via the pontine nuclei, so that's why it could be important to add and insert the uh, ponto or the pontine nuclei. So ponto cerebellum or cerebral ponto cerebellum would be the precise. You see the corresponding nuclei, the globules and the embolithon together called an interposed nucleus because these are located between the fascia and the dentate. If I make an uh, open uh, vermis and hemisphere, so if I compress the C-shaped vermis to straighten, then the most anterior and the most posterior parts are relatively far from each other. In this case, this is the lingula and this is nodal. And the corresponding uh, uh, continuation on the hemisphere is the wing of the lingula, it's not so important, but uh, this is the flocule which is corresponding to the nodules, but the flocculus is part of the uh, hemisphere already. And here you see that uvula is uh, found on the vermis and the corresponding quite large folium on the hemisphere is the uh, tonsil. You see here the tonsil lateral to the uh, uvula. I underlined in this list those folia which would be important by the exam. Uh, the lingua is the first one, uh, which is just about the superior medullary veil, it's not a real uh, folium, it's rather a plate, and uh, the corresponding uh, part on the hemisphere is called wing, and uh, the last one is the nodules, and the corresponding would be the flocculus, and together these are the most ancient parts of the uh, cerebellum, and we have the uvula, and the corresponding part on the mm -hmm. hemisphere is the tonsil. The other uh, folia names are not necessary. Mm -hmm. for this. Here you see MR picture. Uh, one is uh, a special plane which is perpendicular to the horizontal axis of the brainstem. In this picture with high magnification, we are able to see the cerebellar flux, and behind we have the confluence of the dural sinuses, what we study later. In the midline, we see a small part of the herbis, we see the fourth ventricle, and even the medulla oblongata is included, and we see the tonsils. From a vertical uh, or frontal cut, we are able to see a quite uh, uh, similar structure to the uh, uh, oropharyngeal isthmus where we have in the midline the uvula and on each side the palatine tonsil so that's why I got the name in the cerebellum as well uh, uvula is in the midline and the tonsils are parts of the hemisphere if we turn to the histological structure of one folium again I like to highlight here we don't have gyruses, we call the unit folium. Uh, the outer part is gray matter, in spite of the fact that in histo uh, uh, slide, the very first zone seems to be very pale. It's still gray matter. So the first layer in the gray matter is the molecular layer. The next is the Purkinje cell layer, which is basically just one cell wide uh, uh, layer. And the innermost, which is still part of the gray matter, is the granular layer with the most numerous cell of the whole CNS, the granular cell. And in the core, in the axis of the folium, we see white matter. If we see this with large magnification, we see a nice pattern. Uh, and uh, this pattern is similar to a, a special uh, plant. And after this, we call this arbor vitae, which means in English, tree of life. I inserted a new uh, figure uh, to my lecture and it shows in a simplified manner the uh, basic connections. 
we have several afferent axons uh, from various uh, sources, what we describe later, and they are able to stimulate the deep nuclei or uh, intracerebellar nuclei, such as the globulus fastidial dentate and emboliform, and at the same time, they are able to activate the Purkinje cells as well. And the Purkinje cells then are able to inhibit these uh, nerve cells in the uh, intracellular nucleus. So it, they seem to be uh, uh, an important negative control of the overstimulation or avoiding the overstimulation. If you have too much afferent stimulus coming in, then via this circuit, the Purkinje cells are able to inhibit uh, the different uh, pathways, start points. <coughs> Here you see the different neurotransmitters, those which are excitatory use uh, glutamate and the other, which is inhibitory, the blue one in this case, is uh, using uh, GABA. And uh, this is important that the different uh, fibers or pathways of the cerebellum originate mostly from these nuclei uh, on the next uh, lecture I will mention. It's a more complicated version. We have two uh, major afferent types. One is the climbing fiber, which comes only from one source, which means the inferior liver nucleus, and it's able to activate the uh, deep nuclei, such as globus fastigial dentate and emboliform, from where we have the major output. And at the same time, it's able to uh, uh, activate the poor cells you will see later that it is a direct connection. The other and the majority will be via the MOSI fibers, which uh, are able to activate either the uh, nerve cells in the deep or intracellular nuclei and the Purkinje cells, but this will be indirect, you will see very soon. And when the Purkinje cells are activated, they will release GABA, and that's why they provide a, a negative control of this stimulus. Now, on this uh, health of a folium, I like to uh, represent the extension of the different uh, nerve cells in the cerebellar cortex. And uh, I like to highlight that this is health of the folium, so this is a transverse cut. But this way we are able to see the longitudinal axis and uh, uh, from a other aspect, the uh, extension of the folium along the longitudinal axis as well. The major cell is the Purkinje cell. One is represented here with the complete dendrite tree. And I want to highlight that the dendrites are seen on a transverse cut. But if we watch this from a lateral aspect, we see that they don't, uh, I mean, the dendrite tree doesn't extend uh, in 3Ds, only in 2Ds, such as this. The, other are, the others are just the cell values of the Purkinje cells. There's a carrot, it's quite large. Uh, pericardium is typical for the, the Purkinje cell. The axon then passes through the granular layer and then enters the uh, white matter and they are able to uh, terminate mostly on the intracerebellar nuclei or deep nuclei as we mentioned earlier. <coughs> now let's see what is able to stimulate the uh, Purkinje cells. One is the climbing fiber which is uh, from one source only, from the inferior olivary nucleus, and it's able to climb up on the dendrite tree and it's able to activate with aspartate the Purkinje cells. As you see here, again from that aspect, it extends only in uh, 2Ds. The other uh, stimulatory afferent, uh, where or how the uh, majority of the afferent pathways terminate is the mossy fiber and uh, it's not able to directly stimulate the, the Purkinje cells. Instead, it's able to activate the, the uh, most numerous cell type in the whole scene as the granular cells uh, via the dendrites. And uh, then the axon of the uh, granular cell ascends to the molecular layer where it splits into two and this is called parallel fiber. And this parallel fiber runs uh, along the longitudinal axis of the folium, so that's why in a transverse cut we are able to see them in a little spots only. But these little uh, pa uh, parallel fibers are able to activate everything on their route. So the dendrite, which could be here, of these Purkinje cells, and also some other uh, inhibitory cells. 
what are these? One is located in the deeper layer, the molecular layer. These are the basket cells, which extend transversely, and uh, the axons at the end are able to inhibit the Purkinje cells. Approximately 10-15 Purkinje cell wide zone uh, lateral to the activated zone. So here we have an activation, and laterally on each side, so on the other side as well, we have 10-15 Purkinje cell wide area where the Purkinje cells are inhibited. And this way, if you think it over, the Purkinje cell when it was activated would release GABA, so it is inhibitory, but when we inhibit 10-15 Purkinje cell wide zone laterally to the activation, these Purkinje cells are inhibited, so they don't release GABA on the target cells, so that's why they become relatively excitatory on the neurons of the uh, intracerebral nucleus. So this is what we have to keep in mind. The other uh, inhibitory cell is the stellate cell, which is activated by the uh, parallel fibers as well, and they extend again transversely, so again they play a role in the 10-15 Purkinje cell wide inhibitory zone, but they are able to inhibit the Purkinje cells on the dendrite tree and not at the level of the exome hillock. So these uh, uh, inhibitory cells, the basket and the stellate, are uh, very important in the so-called collateral inhibition. So we have an activated zone and then on each side we have an inhibitory zone, an inhibited zone, and this is how in general the CNS works. At the end of this figure we have the biggest cell of the cerebellum which forms functional and morphological units in the cerebellar cortex. These are called Golgi cells having several dendrites in, either in the granular layer and molecular layer, and it has also, or they have also axons running back to the junction between the green and yellow. This is called as a, a cerebellar uh, glomerulus, which is a compound synapse. I will mention it very soon. There are some data about the uh, cell number in a certain unit. If we regard one uh, square millimeter, we have approximately 500 Purkinje cells, 600 basket cells, 50 Golgi, and the most numerous 3 million granular cells, and the approximately 600,000 uh, uh, compound synapses called cerebellar glomeruli. Uh, this is a, a simplified version of the contents. The molecular layer, the uppermost, contains the dendrite tree of the Purkinje cell and uh, some Golgi cell dendrites as well. We have otherwise Bergman layer branches, what, uh, not seen in the uh, figure. This is a special layer in the cerebellum only. And I will return to the role of the Bergman layer later. And uh, we have completely the cell bodies and the processes of the inhibitory cells, such as the stellate and basket cells in this zone. So here you see the stellate and basket in the molecular layer. And, uh, but the next is the Purkinje cell layer, which is the shortest. Here we have the cell bodies of the Purkinje cells, also the cell bodies of the, of the Bergman layer, and we have this negative inhibitory you know, synapse between the uh, exon terminus of the basket cells and the exon hillock of the Purkinje cells. I mentioned several times here earlier. And the deepest uh, layer of the gray matter is the granular layer, where we have the cell bodies and the dendrites and the beginning of the axon of the, the granular cell and this is where we have the largest cells also located with the cell body in most of the, of the processes that is the Golgi cell and otherwise this is where the mossy fiber comes in the pink to activate the dendrites of the granular cells of course the climbing fiber what I haven't mentioned yet uh, it passes through the uh, granular layer then Purkinje cell layer to be able to reach the molecular layer where it's able to excite directly the Purkinje cells. Here you see otherwise that both the, the climbing and the mossy fibers are able to excite the intracerebellar nuclei from where the efferent pathways start and at the same time uh, against the overstimulation they are able to uh, activate the Purkinje cells to block these nerve cells. Uh, these are the simplified intercellular connections 
the two afferents which are able to excite the Purkinje cells. Uh, one is directly the climbing fiber, the other one indirectly to the granular cell. And the granular cell then uh, forms the uh, parallel fibers, and the parallel fiber is able to activate everything in the road. But what I want to highlight is that, of course, it doesn't make sense if one parallel fiber activate, activates one Purkinje and then while the other inhibitor cells inhibit the same Purkinje cells. It just shows the possibilities, the options for the intracerebellar connections, so between the cells. But otherwise, uh, the uh, parallel fiber would activate st uh, uh, stellate and basket cells, which then uh, inhibit other Purkinje cells around. So we have activation and around we have inhibitory zone. So that just shows simplified, the simplified manner of the intracellular connections. And this one includes the intracerebellar nuclei as well. The incoming climbing fiber is able to directly stimulate either the uh, intracerebellar nuclei and the dendrite of the Purkinje cell. The MOSI fiber directly uh, stimulate the uh, nerve cells in the intracerebellar nuclei, and otherwise, while the granular cell and parallel fiber is able to activate the Purkinje cells. Here I label the different pathways and this is a new one that from the infer from the intracellular nuclei we have direct connection to the inferior oliver nucleus but I will mention it in the next uh, lecture as well. Uh, this is again the simplified uh, uh, version of the intercellular connections and again I want to highlight that if we activate with the parallel fibers from one granule cell the Purkinje cells doesn't make sense to activate the basket and cell it to inhibit the same. So these collateral inhibitions are on other Purkinje cells in the vicinity. And Golgi is again over, against uh, the over uh, stimulation. Uh, so the, if we have too much stimulation, then the Golgi is able to block this transmission. But I will mention it very soon. This uh, complex synapse or compound synapse where these three cells are found not only two, uh, this is the uh, glomerular, uh, the cerebellar glomerulus. So the cerebellar glomerulus is a compound synapse and what I want to highlight, all the uh, junctions or synapses are oxodendritic, which is a bit surprising because we could expect that the last one, which is inhibitory, would be axonic, but in this case this is also uh, excellent writing. So, what are the major uh, uh, junctions here? The primary is the mossy fiber dendrite of the granule cell blue and red. This is excitatory using glutamate. So, this is how the mossy fiber is able to excite the dendrite of the granule cells. At the same time, the Golgi cell receives also information about the stimulus. So, that's why a junction between the mossy fiber and the dendrite of the Golgi, which is also excitatory, obviously. And the Golgi then, uh, to protect uh, the cerebellar co uh, cortex from the overstimulation, while the axon is able to inhibit the dendrite of the granule cell, and this is uh, with the GABA uh, neurotransmitter. Uh, these uh, pictures are from our uh, slides, uh, where we can uh, recap the uh, staining methods as well. The first one is a missile uh, stain slide. Uh, the key cell here is the Purkinje cell with uh, quite large carrot-like uh, or shaped pericarion. And you see with missile the beginning of the dendrites as well because uh, we studied that the missile is able to visualize the enlarged uh, rough endoplasmic reticulum located in the cell body or pericarion and the beginning of the dendrites. Uh, in the upper part, you see the largest part of the molecular layer, and in the vicinity of the Purkinje cells, we have a transversely extended uh, small cell type. These are the basket cells, we don't see the processes, just the beginning of the dendrites. And the most numerous cell type in the granular layer is the granular cell, you see the rounded nuclei. The next is an interesting staining method, it's kind of modification of Bilshovsky made by Kellerman and here you see the uh, axons with 
uh, black line and you see how nicely the axons uh, of the basket cells are able to form a basket synapse around the axon block of the uh, Purkinje cells. This is inhibitory. Uh, there are some axons running transversely in the lower part of the uh, molecular layer where the cell with the uh, basket cells are also located. With higher magnification, you see this nice uh, basket synapse around the axon of the Purkinje cells. Otherwise, this is how transversely the uh, axons of the basket cells run, and at the end they go down to the axon hill. And uh, it's a, a lucky uh, situation because we were able to visualize the uh, climbing fiber running or climbing up on the dendrite of the uh, Purkinje cell. This is with Golgi impregnation. And uh, as we studied, the Golgi uh, is able to visualize not only the cell body or uh, the processes, but both. But we can predict uh, what cells will be visualized. That's why we have to uh, double check all the preparations. This shows a nice uh, Purkinje cell with characteristic carrot-like uh, uh, cell body and the dendrite tree. And you see even with this magnification, the little spines on the dendrite tree. Uh, here we see in, in the lower part of the uh, molecular layer a basket cell, the axon of which runs transversely in the folium, and this is the Bergman layer, which is a very special layer in the uh, cerebellum, the function we will mention in black structure. Uh, the uh, Bergman uh, layer is also seen in this picture, and the, in the upper part of the molecular layer, layer we are able to see the other inhibitor cell called Sterlet cell. And uh, we can use the Bergman layer and the uh, Purkinje uh, cell dendrite tree to estimate the thickness of the molecular layer to be oriented in the slide. Here you see two uh, folia uh, facing to, towards each other. And where the cell body of the Purkinje cell is, this is the Purkinje cell layer. Otherwise, upward we have the molecular layer. And on the uh, other folio, this would be the thickness of the molecular layer, and this is the cell body of the Purkinje cell. A little bit deeper, we see a quite irregular and enlarged cell body. This is uh, part of the Golgi cell, and if you see a messy uh, spots, these are astrocytes. If these are located in the gray matter, as probably these cells, for example, because the granular cell is here, this is in the granular layer, but th that's why these are probably protoplasmic layer cells. And with larger magnification, you see the typical granule cells, tiny rounded cell bodies with four or five burko like uh, dendrites. This is a summary about the uh, connections. Uh, two uh, excitatory uh, fibers are able to excite the Purkinje cells. The climbing is directly able to uh, activate Purkinje cells at the same time, stimulates the nerve cells in the deep or intracellular nuclei. The mossy fibers are also able to uh, activate the uh, nerve cells in the uh, cerebellar nuclei directly. Otherwise, through the granular cells, are able to activate the Purkinje cells. The Purkinje cells, when they're activated, are inhibitory cells, and that's why we have a control over the uh, overstimulation. And uh, the granular cells, at the same time, are able to uh, activate uh, other cortical inhibitory interneurons, such as the basket, stellate, and even the Golgi cells, which are able to uh, inactivate the Purkinje cells, so that's why these are for the collateral inhibition. Here you see the efferent, here the afferent uh, sources or targets, and I will mention the uh, pathways, the afferent and efferent pathways next time. And uh, this would be an uh, important uh, summary about the functions. The Purkinje cells are inhibitory using GABA. They inhibit the intracerebral nuclei nerve cells. And otherwise, the deep nuclei, so these intracerebral nuclei are regarded as switching, switching stations because the incoming mossy and climbing fibers are activating these. And this is uh, what you see here, that the cerebellar cortex controls the accomplishment of the motor correction. This is a kind of summary. This is a, a transversal cut, uh, a transverse cut of the folium. 
showing one activated Purkinje cell, on each side we have otherwise 10, 15 Purkinje cell wide, Purkinje cell wide uh, inactivation or inhibited, inhibited uh, zone. And from above you see the extension of the dendrite here of the Purkinje cells. As I mentioned, this is only in two days. And uh, we have uh, inhibitory cells, other inhibitory cells in the cortex, cerebellar cortex. The upper is the stellate, the uh, lower is the basket. The basket is able to inhibit at the level of the uh, axon hillock, the stellate at the level of the dendrites. And from above, you see that if this is the activated zone regarding the Purkinje cells, beside we have two inhibitory zones. And uh, this is the Golgi, which uh, forms a territory in the cerebellar cortex. Uh, they form columnar uh, morphological and functional units. And uh, these are seen uh, together with the other cells and the only excitatory cell in the whole cerebellar uh, cortex, and I want to highlight it, is the granular layer. Uh, I mean the granular cell in the granular layer. Uh, these uh, axons ascend to the molecular layer where they run uh, parallel to the longitudinal axis of the folium after the division. So these are the parallel fibers and they will activate everything in the path. So that's why they form an activated zone regarding the Purkinje cells. These and on each side because they activate also the inhibitory cells, the basket and the stellate we have an inhibitory zone. But don't forget, we have to translate it to the level of the output signal if in the activated zone the Purkinje cells are able to release GABA on the neurons of the intracerebral nuclei. This way, these are inhibitory. And on each side, where we have the inhibition of the uh, inhibitory Purkinje cells, they provide a relative excitatory signal to the target cells, which are mostly the intracerebral nuclei nerve cells. <clears throat> Here I summarize some interesting data. So one olivary afferent uh, divides into 10 climbing fibers. Each then is able to uh, directly activate one Purkinje cell. The mostly fibers are much more diverse, diverse cell type because they are able to form synapse with 400 cells even and not only in one folium, even in other folia. We have a significant uh, divergence because uh, the uh, parallel fibers, for example here, are able to activate approximately 400 Purkinje cells along. Uh, it means a um, 7 mm long uh, zone. And we have a significant convergence as well on the Purkinje cells because uh, around each the uh, Purkinje cell, we have approximately 175,000 uh, uh, synapses with parallel fibers, so these are able to activate the Purkinje cells. And uh, this summarizes the uh, activation zones with the so-called MOSI fibers. We are able to activate along the uh, longitudinal axis of the folium with the uh, climbing fibers uh, from the inferior nucleus, we have transversely uh, activated zones. And the last picture shows <coughs> the uh, new data. In addition to the classic model, uh, those cells what I mentioned, uh, two other cells are listed. Lugaro cell, which is an inhibitory cell, inhibitor interneuron, which is activated also by the MOSI fibers, able to uh, inhibit uh, the dendrite of the Golgi cell and the unicellular brush cell is another interneuron, but this is active, uh, excitatory uh, interneuron. It is also activated by the MOSI and it excites the dendrites of the granular cells. So uh, the fine tuning mechanism within the cerebral cortex is not so well known. Uh, what is uh, new in addition to this, that we have a direct contact between the uh, deep uh, or intracellular nuclei and the inferior nucleus, because all textbooks usually teach an indirect uh, connection uh, between these two, uh, regarding the different pathways, at least, the different pathways of the cerebral, the afferent is direct. But this shows uh, uh, in the Angelo paper in 2016 that probably we have a, a direct 
efferent pathway also from the cerebellum to the inferior the nucleus, like I mentioned it in the next lecture. And these are the uh, considerations of this. We have uh, two types of the uh, dendro uh, the Golgi cell activation. One is uh, the, gra the granular cell and uh, in the molecular layer, and the other is in the uh, that is the second one through the parallel fibers, and the first one is uh, the, in the uh, granular layer where we have direct uh, connection in the cerebellar. Uh, <coughs> and this is another interesting uh, statement that the molecular layer inhibitor cells, including stellate and basket cells, which are activated by the parallel fibers, they are able to inhibit the Purkinje, Purkinje cells, and probably this is for the synchronization of the Purkinje cell activity. And uh, I think uh, this is an interesting. Uh, uh, statement, as, statement as well, because the cellular microcyclic includes these elements, and this way we have a transverse and also longitudinal uh, activation. The meaning of this intracellular connection will be mentioned in the next lecture when we add the afferent and different uh, fibers and pathways as well. Thank you.